Amen. Amen. Well, go ahead and have a seat. Today we are continuing in our sermon series called This Is Us. And if you have your Bible or Bible app, you can go ahead and turn to either Philippians 4 or Acts chapter 3. If you did not bring a Bible with you, I want to encourage you and invite you to use, to use the Bible underneath the seat in front of you, and you'll find Acts chapter 3 on page 1083, or you'll find Philippians 4 on page 1166. And as always, if you do not have a Bible that you can read or understand easily, we want you and we encourage you and invite you to take one of our Bibles home with you, call it yours, write your name in it, and read it every day. We believe if we read God's Word and apply His Word, He will change our lives. And we're all looking for transformation. And you're going to discover that as you apply the principles of God's Word to your life, you will experience life change. Now, a few weeks ago, we began this series called This Is Us, and essentially what we're talking about is who we are at Calvary from a leadership point of view. But here's the deal. The reason why we're talking about who we are is because you are us, right? That we are together, we are Calvary and our values we want to see in your life as well because we really believe that if we all value the same thing, we're gonna continue to see your life changed, my life changed and the community around us changed and transformed by the gospel. Now our core values, we have five core values. Uh, they are relatable truth, in other words, we want people to be able to apply God's word to their lives. Transparent living, as Pastor Chad talked about last week. Uh, we're not going to pretend to be anything other than what we are. And tonight, we're talking about contagious celebration. The other two are uncomfortable grace and radical service. As a church family, we want to encourage you to adopt these core values into your own life. And like I said, today we're talking about contagious celebration. Now I'm a sports fan, I, I enjoy sports. I like watching football and baseball. Anything that gets, uh, you know, gets my heart rate going, I enjoy. And one of the things that I uh, loved seeing as an early Christian, uh, we would take a student ministry, we would take a student ministry, me as a volunteer leader, to a big event in Nashville, Tennessee called the Youth Evangelism Conference. And there were about 15,000 teenagers that would gather on an annual basis and they were rocking out to worship songs and they were hearing messages and they were surrendering their lives to, to Jesus or in ministry or whatever. But one of the things that I really loved is when 15,000 teenagers would do the wave. You know what I'm talking about? Not this, but where people were, you know, where these students were just at random getting up and doing the wave and trying to get it to go all the way around the Coliseum or all the way around the stadium. And so as a volunteer, I was watching this and we were just unorganized. It just was a little bit chaotic. Nobody was seeming to get it until I just jumped up at random in front of 15,000 teenagers and stood up and said, all right, we're gonna do the wave and we're gonna do it all the way around the Coliseum and we're going to get it going and we're going to start with this section and then we're going to go here and then we're going to go there and we did it, right? It started here and it started small and then we kept at it and eventually every person, every teenager in that stadium all the way around was doing the wave. Contagious celebration. We're going to do the wave right now. And we're gonna start over here with this section and we're gonna see if we can get it all the way across and then all the way back. It's completely up to you. Now, if you have health issues, if you can't stand up, if it just makes you sick to your stomach, don't do it. But we're gonna see how good this five o'clock service is and see if we're able to do the wave, okay? All right, so here we go. In three, two, one. And back, send it back, send it back, send it back. Oh, 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 we got to start over. All right, here we go. Here we go. 
We got to start over. Here we go. Three, two, one. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. And back, back, back. Send it back. Send it back. Send it back. Send it back. <laughs> all right, I'm going to take it because we don't have to all, time, all night. How did it feel? We enjoy celebrating. Nobody told you guys to shout, by the way. Right? I just told you to stand up and do the wave. You chose to go, woo! Like you were out at the beach at Rotary or something. Well, at Calvary, we believe that following Jesus results in a joy-filled life that draws people to Jesus. We believe that following Jesus results in a joy-filled life that draws other people to Jesus. When the Apostle Paul was writing to the Philippians, he said in Philippians verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. We believe that when followers of Jesus celebrate the life change, celebrate the work that God is doing in their lives, other people are going to be drawn to Jesus. Now, I have been around followers of Jesus that never seem to enjoy following Jesus. Uh, in fact, I've been around whole churches that didn't even want to smile or crack a smile or it looked like they'd all been sucking on lemons before the message. But that is not who God created us to be. And that's not who we want to be here at Calvary. We want to be followers of Jesus who are filled with joy because life is simply more fun that way. And other people around us that don't have Jesus are gonna be drawn to the change in our lives. Now, I can't find any man in scripture that best demonstrates this other than the man that we're gonna read about in Acts chapter three. He's a crippled man. And we're gonna read about him in just a few seconds. I don't know how old this man was, but I do know that scripture tells us that since he was born, he had been crippled and that other people were in charge of carrying him around. He never learned to stand. He never learned to walk. He never learned what it was like to skip or to jump rope or to run and feel the wind in his face. Now, during this season, Anytime somebody was crippled or blind or had a birth defect or they were paralyzed or diseased, they were considered an outcast. And from the time of his birth, this man had been rejected by his world. This man had been rejected by his culture, but his life was about to radically change. And he's going to set for us an example of what it means to contagiously celebrate life change. Now, Peter and John were apostles of Jesus, and they had been with Jesus throughout his ministry. They saw Jesus crucified. They saw him die on the cross. Then they talked to Jesus after he rose from the dead. And right before Jesus ascended into heaven, he commanded them to go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus left the earth. So in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John are on their way to the temple when they encounter this man. Acts chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth, that's the man that we're going to talk about, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by his right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. 
All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety, we have made him walk. And then Peter continues to preach to the Israelites. Now we're gonna look at the end of his message in a few minutes, but right now I want us to focus on this man and his example of contagious celebration. He had just been sitting outside the temple asking for money and unexpectedly his life was changed forever. Peter and John looked at him and said, look, we don't have any silver or gold, but what we have, we give you in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. Then Peter took him by the hand and as the man rose to his feet, his feet and his ankles were healed. Like this is a true historical account of what happened. For this man, that meant no more begging for food every single day of his life. No more sitting outside the temple begging for money. No more depending on other people to lug him around and move him from place to place. No more dragging himself through the town. He was changed. He was made better. He was a new person. So how does that relate to you and to I? So if by faith you've believed in Jesus as the son of God, if by faith you believe that Jesus died on the cross, paying the penalty for your sins, if you believe that he rose from the dead, if you believe that one day he's going to return, if by faith you took a moment and you received Jesus into your life and committed to follow him by surrendering your life to him, then you know exactly how that man felt 2,000 years ago. Before you and I became followers of Jesus, we were just like that crippled beggar. We lived crippled by sin, crippled by shame, crippled by guilt, crippled by loneliness, crippled by depression, crippled by hopelessness, crippled by doubt. But when we became a follower of Jesus, we were no longer crippled. We were made new and we were set free. We were set free to follow Jesus. We were set free to show grace to other people. We were set free to hope and to believe that the best days are ahead of us. We were set free to experience the overwhelming, never-ending, breathtaking love of God. And so as we remember what we were rescued from, we should look at the example that this man provides. While this man was healed physically, you and I have been healed spiritually. We've been changed and transformed spiritually. So followers of Jesus should celebrate life change hard. That's what followers of Jesus ought to do. In Acts 3, 8, we see that this man leaping up, he stood, he began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Can you imagine what it would be like to be an older man and for the first time be able to walk? And the scripture tells us he was walking, showing us that the man was indeed healed. He was no longer laying in the dirt. He was now upright walking and he wasn't just walking. He used the muscles in his legs that had been healed to do something. He was leaping on legs that he'd never stood on before. He was leaping and he was praising demonstrating that it wasn't Peter and John that healed him, but it was the power of God that brought healing to him. The old crippled man was no more. He was living a brand new life 
and he could not have celebrated any harder. Walking, leaping, and praising God. Now, if there's anything that the people of Havasu do well, it's celebrate. The people of Havasu know how to celebrate hard. They party on the water. They party in the desert. They party at Rotary. They party at the gun range. They get in their side-by-sides and they get in their Jeeps and they ride out in the desert and they have a good time. People love to celebrate here in Havasu. They love to gather with friends. And at Calvary, it seems that we love to celebrate as well. We love to celebrate baptisms. We love to see a person respond. They, they've trusted Jesus as Savior. They want to tell the whole world and they get baptized. And there's always celebration or applause or whistling when that occurs. We celebrate marriages when they're rescued from the brink of divorce uh, and they're restored and they're brought back together. We show testimonies of people celebrating God's faithfulness in their lives. And we applaud and we celebrate. Uh, we celebrate stories of people who are rescued from addictions. And as they celebrate their new life in Jesus, we stand to our feet and we encourage them. We celebrate generosity when we're raising funds for, for wells in Africa or we're raising money for Compassion Center. Uh, I'll never forget when Pastor Chad stood up here and said, hey, we got to raise 75000 78000 for a Compassion Center. And within a week, it seems like all the money came in and then we celebrated and then almost uh, that same amount came in the following week or something like that. People love to celebrate and we celebrate generosity. We celebrate our benevolence offering. We love to hear the difference that what we take up every month makes a difference in our community. But I love it if we celebrate it harder. I'd love it if we celebrated more in worship I sometimes wish our voices would drown out the band. And as loud as our sound system is, for some of you guys that sit there like this, we do have, ear, we do have earplugs in the Connection Center. But sometimes I wish that the voices, our voices together would drown out the band because we're celebrating harder and we're lifting up our voices. And sometimes I wish that our applause would linger longer after a baptism, showing kids and grandparents and whoever was baptized that they just made the life-changing decision to demonstrate to the whole world their faith in Christ. And we want to encourage them because sometimes I know that I'm doing this. Yay. And I'm giving the golf clap. Ooh, this is so good. Oh, good. Praise God. And in reality, I wish all of us were like, man, that's awesome. Woo, that's so incredible. Contagious celebration. And that's the type of celebration that this man demonstrated. Unharnessed enthusiasm for the work that God did in his life. And the reason that I sometimes find myself wishing for that is that I recognize contagious celebration attracts others. Contagious celebration attracts other people to Jesus. As this man was hooping and hollering, leaping and shouting and praising God, you see what happened in the community? Everybody that had seen the old crippled man now saw the new crippled man walking and leaping and shouting and praising God, and they all rushed together. Acts 3 verse 11 says, While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them. The people heard the celebration and they were curious about what this man had experienced. See, when we celebrate our faith in Jesus, when we celebrate the fact that we have indeed been made a new creation, that's not just words on a page. We've literally been made new. I am not the same person that I once was in 1991 because Jesus changed me immediately. Jesus changed me and I became a new creation. And so have you. And when we celebrate that life change, when we celebrate our faith, those people who don't yet know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, 
which might be somebody in this room right now, they're going to be drawn. They're going to be curious about the life change. They're going to be curious about how was it that you changed? You're no longer living the same way that you lived before. You, you once were an old sourpuss, and now you're filled with joy. What happened? What's going on? And as they see us live out lives that celebrate grace and celebrate redemption and celebrate hope and celebrate peace and celebrate forgiveness and celebrate a relationship with God, they're going to be drawn in and attracted to Jesus. And if we continue to celebrate, our celebration will draw other people in. Why? Because people love to party. People want to be a part of what's happening. I was a, a, a student pastor at a church in Georgia. Naomi was about four years old and we were having college students over to our house. We were having a party. So my wife sent me to the grocery store to get snacks and we're getting chips and drinks. And Naomi said, what's, you know, what are we doing or whatever, whatever she asked at four years old. And I explained to her, I said, Naomi, we're having uh, students coming over to the house. We're, at, we're having a party with them tonight. Naomi stood up in the grocery cart. She spread out her arms and she said, everybody come to my house. <laughs> we love to celebrate. We love to have a good time. We're wired, in fact, we're wired that way. And when we celebrate Jesus, when we celebrate the life change that has occurred in our lives as new believers, it's freeing and it's contagious. And when we're sincere and transparent about the change in our lives, other people are going to be drawn. And that leads me to my final point. Contagious celebration leads to more changed lives. Contagious celebration leads to more changed lives. These crowds of people, they rushed in when they heard the celebration of this formerly crippled man. They rushed in and Peter looked around, remembering what Jesus had commissioned him to do, remembering his mission, which was to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. He just said it differently. He looked around, he sees all these people. All these people are asking questions. Hey, weren't you, this, weren't you the guy that begged for money every day? Were you tricking us? Were you deceptive? What has happened? How are you able to walk? How are you able to leap up and down like that? What happened to you? And Peter responded in verse 12. Peter saw his opportunity and he addressed the crowd and he said, people of Israel, what's so surprising about this? And why do you stare at us as though we made this man walk? Peter saw when all the crowd gathered together, his opportunity to tell people about Jesus. Now look, let me explain it this way. The pastors that stand in this pulpit, we love to talk about Jesus. We love to tell people about Jesus and we love to invite people to Jesus. You might feel nervous about that. You might feel uneasy about verbally sharing the gospel. Guess what? We will. You celebrate, you celebrate life change. You draw other people in. You invite them here to this place. We'll share Jesus with them. Our prayer team is at the front of our service, at the front of our stage after every service, and they love to pray with people and lead them to Jesus. And maybe if you're interested in being a part of our prayer team, fill out that serve card and let us know. We'd love to have you as part of that prayer team to lead people to Jesus and to pray with people over whatever needs they have. But see, at Calvary, we believe in contagious celebration, and that doesn't just happen in this room. How you celebrate out there is why people are going to want to hitch a ride with you to church. They're going to say, hey, what is going on in your life? Come on to Calvary. You'll, you'll understand later. Come on to Calvary. It's easier to explain by showing you transformed lives than telling you about it. And people are going to be drawn. 
So for the rest of this chapter, Peter tells these people about hope and about forgiveness through Jesus. He helped them understand that it was the power of Jesus that healed that crippled man and that Jesus could give them a new life as well and they could experience forgiveness of sins. I love it when family and friends are invited to celebrate baptism. And one of the reasons why I camp out on baptism for just a, just a second is because that's what Jesus told us to do after we become a follower of him, is to celebrate through baptism, to demonstrate to the entire world, or at least our world, that Jesus has changed us. We're no longer the same person, that the, the old Joe Donahue is gone, like buried in a grave, and the new Joe Donahue was raised to life. And when you become a follower of Jesus and you invite people to celebrate baptism, that's an opportunity for them to hear the message of hope, to hear the message of forgiveness. And I love it. We've seen it happen over and over again over the last year and a half, two years, as when a family member comes and they watch a family, be, a person of their family being baptized and they begin to ask questions and then they surrender their lives to Jesus and then they get baptized, that's contagious celebration. So Peter takes the opportunity and he tells them about Jesus and then skip to Acts chapter four, verse four. When Peter wrapped up his message, he gave, quote, an invitation and scripture tells us, but many of those who had heard the word believe and the number of men came to be about 5,000 people. Why? Because one man celebrated life change. One man stood up and did the wave in church. One man stood up, leaped, and praised God. And because he celebrated the transformation in his life, other people came in. Peter saw it as an opportunity to tell them about forgiveness, and people surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. When followers of Jesus, when we celebrate our faith, others can be drawn in out of curiosity and become followers of Jesus as well. And if you've not yet become a follower of Jesus, let me encourage you, it's so simple. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that means number one, he's the boss. And you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. He's not dead anymore. Jesus didn't die. There's no, uh, there's no tomb around this earth that has Jesus' bones. He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart, God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Saved, relationship with God, forgiveness of sins, peace from despair, peace from brokenness, peace regardless of whatever adversity you find yourself in, that you have a relationship with God that makes a difference. And you'll be in heaven when you die. That's incredible. And it's free and there's no strings attached. And if you desire to surrender your life to Jesus, all you have to do is say, Jesus, I, I confess you as Lord and I commit to following you. I, I turn away from my old life and I turn to you and I surrender my life into your hands. And you will be changed and you will be transformed and you will be made new. And then you get to join with other followers of Jesus because what we have to celebrate trumps any type of physical transformation. That wasn't a pol political speech. Some of you guys perked up, Trump, what, what? <laughs> any type of spiritual change trumps any type of physical change in your life. You may never be able to walk and leap and stretch out your hands, but you can be forgiven. You can be forgiven for your sins and you can be made new. That was the message that Peter shared with the crowd. He didn't say to them, hey, anybody else among you is sick? Anybody else have a disease? He said, let me tell you the biggest problem. You need Jesus. You need to be forgiven for your sins and experience hope because there's a God that loves you so much, that cares for you so much. And Jesus gave his life for you. So as followers of Jesus, we get to celebrate because our Jesus defeated sin. 
we get to celebrate because Jesus defeated death. I might die in this physical body, but I will not experience spiritual death. We can celebrate because our Jesus holds the keys to life and death. We can celebrate because Jesus through the cross has defeated hopelessness. He's defeated despair. Jesus has defeated brokenness. Jesus has defeated loneliness. Jesus has defeated every impact of sin in your life. Jesus has defeated addiction. We can celebrate because through Jesus and through the cross and through the resurrection, God has sent his Holy Spirit here to guide us. You and I are not alone. We're not left to wander around aimlessly, but we have been given the guidance of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So we can celebrate knowing for certain that we will also be in heaven. We can celebrate because there is not one thing that can separate you and I from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. God will never ever, God will never ever turn his love away from you. God will never ever stop loving you. He cares for you and that is, is good reason why you and I should live our lives celebrating more. Spiritually walking, spiritually leaping, spiritually smiling because of the work that Jesus did in our lives. That is why contagious celebration is one of our core values here at Calvary. And that's why I hope it becomes one of your core values as well. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to say thank you for what Jesus has done. Thank you for the work. Thank you for the hope. Thank you for forgiveness and peace and joy that we have because of Christ. Thank you that he has set us free and given us peace. Lord, it's our prayer that we would celebrate. I, I know so often I get focused on health issues with my family. I get focused on health issues with me. Uh, Lord, I get focused on things that ultimately can't hinder my relationship with you, but I allow them to. And Lord, I thank you for the freedom that we have in Christ and the hope that we have in Christ and the joy. And Lord, it's my prayer that if somebody here in this room today, they're not yet a follower of Jesus because they've not yet surrendered their lives, uh, God, I ask that you would draw them to, to you. Let them experience peace and joy like never before and let them realize their hope in you. Father, we love you. Help us to celebrate. Help us to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen.